chapter 4 of uh, social justice and food security, um, agriculture and food security, a responsibility for climate change and sustainable development. Okay, those are pretty scientific words, and I think Elliot is going to try and explain those before we go any further. But before we do that, Elliot, do you want to? talk about chapters one to three, just give a brief summary of what we've talked about. It's your book, you wrote it soon after finishing your studies in, was that, what country was that, Holland? Sweden. Ah, Sweden. So yes. soon after you completed some studies in Sweden, you yeah. came up with this book. And I think um, it's an important book for us to discuss because it plays also into the current global uh, your positioning of different countries, including the United States, United Kingdom, um, Africa, needs food, and we can we can grow our own food, but it seems there is a problem of hunger, and we're going to try and find out why. So, Elliot, do you want to go through chapters one to three, please? Yes. Uh, firstly, I think chapter one I introduced the subject, which is sustainable development and climate change. Uh, it's sort of an exploration of uh, the, the entire subject of uh, climate change, bringing in also critically uh, the various debates uh, is, uh, is reflected by UN summits. So I looked at uh, the summit in Rio de Janeiro uh, of 1992. Uh, we also looked at subsequent summits including the Jobbeck of uh, 2002. But also high on the agenda was to say, okay, fine, the, where are we now? Uh, given that we, after every four years, the United Nations uh, sort of calls in for a summit where all the countries of the world meet review the current endeavors of uh, uh, auditing on global warming, uh, auditing also on including the MDGs, Millennium Development Goals, uh, that were up to 2015. And then uh, we also looked at the uh, leading to the SDGs, which is the Sustainable Development uh, Goals. So yes, and uh, the, the last two, uh, chapter three and two, we're mostly looking at the population explosion. That uh, is, we look at uh, 2025, when the population will be 8.5 billion, uh, given that the food security currently uh, facing the governments and also the UN that millions of people go hungry every every day. Uh, will the world be ready to be able to uh, extend or to meet the food security of 1.5 billion extra mouth coming by 2025? So yes, those were certain challenges and uh, the critical analysis that we, we, we looked at. We also looked at the, the competition between energy and food security. Uh, with the view that, uh, yes, the world have embraced uh, biofuel. Uh, we have seen countries like Brazil and the United States of America also growing maize uh, to convert into biofuel and uh, thereby competing with the food, with the human consumption. Uh, uh, so, yes, we, we looked at that as well. And uh, we also reflected on the debate currently in the United States, um, given that we now have got a new president, Donald Trump, who believes that global warming is a myth. And uh, so, yes, the challenges as to what to now be the case, the challenges for United Nations. Yes, in summary, yes, that, that's what we've covered. And um, over to you, uh, Derek. Okay, thank you, Elliot, for that uh, brief but very important summary. So today, you uh, in this chapter four, you look at agriculture and food security, 
and responsibility for climate change and sustainable development. Okay, and I think there is there are a lot of scientific words in, in that title. Would you care to briefly explain? I think people will understand agriculture, but what is the link between agriculture, food security, climate change, and sustainable development? Yes, there is a correlation uh, between food security and and uh, sustainable development. Uh, that uh, I'm going to define that correlation or just sort of make it clear. Uh, now, food security. When we look at the food security, we look at uh, uh, the food production globally, and we know there is there is now. A sort of supply chain, although most of the food stuff, let's give an example for the uh, Western world, for example. Uh, you, uh, within here, for example, in the UK, you get almost uh, all food stuff from all f continents. Uh, now, this, this, the, the, the food that is being imported into the Western world from the developing world. Uh, is yes produced in the developing world but also the challenges that we have is that the very people who are producing the food cannot afford to buy the same food that they are producing that's one challenge that is also in this chapter uh, now why are we interested in sustainability because the Human, human wants are sort of infinite. Yes, in terms of needs against the wants. If you look at the basic needs, food is the basic needs where every individual has got the right to access to food. But however, we've got other nations that also have got uh, unfettered wants. Extra food and some of the countries like UK where 25% of the food stuff they chest is thrown in the bin all the time. And we are saying, is it sustainable, the current situation that we have in terms of population growth against the current level of food production? Is it sustainable? Not only food um, production, but also the distribution of the food. Because you might even, if we're throwing away more than 25%, I think the figure is close to 33% of the food which is bought in the UK is yeah. not thrown in the bin. Yeah. Other because <clears throat> it, it, um, the food actually expires in, in people's homes yeah. and they end up throwing the food away. Or if it's cabbages that they've bought, they might go bad and they might peel off the, the bad parts. But if you add up all the food that is lost, it's, it's more than 33%. Yeah. Now, so it's not just a problem of um, the availability or the production of the food, but the distribution of the current. The distribution is well, yeah. Which so, I suspect may just be enough, but because we're not distributing it equitably, that's where we have a problem. Yeah, and then looking at the climate change and uh, how do we bring in climate change? Uh, yes, we know climate change is, uh, is, 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 is a source of global warming. Uh, here, what you are saying, you are talking about the sustained increase of, uh, of temperatures uh, being caused by uh, human action. Human action here, we are talking about pollution. Uh, as as the, the world industrialized, uh, you find culprits, uh, the Western world themselves, because of the industrialization, they put so much uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that carbon dioxide uh, has been seen over the years. Uh, research has shown that it is damaging the ozone layer. And the ozone layer is actually the membrane that protects us on the Earth from uh, UV light from the sun. And uh, that also has got an influence in terms of, uh, of rain patterns. I think we have seen uh, globally the, the surge of uh, natural disasters, uh, cyclones, for example, which have, uh, have caused either flooding, uh, thereby 
destroy the, the agricultural sector or in, in a way interfering in the food security or food availability itself. So yes, there's, there's that link between uh, the climate change, uh, global warming, the availability of food and distribution of, distribution of food and linked to that is the population growth which uh, policymakers need also to factor in when they are uh, either planning for agricultural output and most yeah. of the countries are, we, we, we know that it is a challenge and uh, especially developing country, countries in Africa uh, we have got an abundance of land, arable land but because of toxic politics uh, and ill governance you find that our policymakers themselves uh, have not uh, coherently put policies that addresses the food security. Yes, and then lastly, on the same point, we also have, um, for example, the Trump presidency. Trump yes. is now the commander in chief in the United States, and his views on climate change or the cause of climate change are in variance with uh, scientific evidence in that he denies the link between uh, human activities of burning greenhouse uh, gases to the increase in, in carbon dioxide which causes the warming of the earth which then causes climate change. So I know the United Nations has tried to have all these summits uh, to talk about the link between all all of the four things we talked about agriculture, food security, sustainable development and climate change. But when we have an influential politician like Donald Trump denying climate change, then we can see how it's going to affect both food security and sustainable development. Because uh, if he reduces funding, and some of the funding is coming from the American government, and also the fact that he has instructed the EPA, which is the Environmental Protection Agency in America, to stop the, I think, monthly or some regular update or reports that they give on how much carbon emission they are emitting into the atmosphere. Um, so we see that political leadership at a global scale can affect all of these things we're talking about. Indeed, yes. I think it's, it's worrying given the situation that uh, since 1992, uh, the Rio de Janeiro uh, summit in Brazil, the, the world has moved uh, forward, uh, I would say, uh, immensely in terms of putting infrastructure uh, in place and harnessing the technology to, 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 to ensure that we've got uh, clean energy that is uh, friendly to the environment and also trying to depart from the use of dead energy like, like uh, thermal power for example. Uh, and yes, uh, and I think uh, as, as lately as in 2015 with the, the Paris, the Paris uh, P20 where global leaders met in Paris and uh, including the, the, the President of the United States, then Barack Obama, who actually committed to specific quotas to stop or mitigate global warming. And uh, less than 12 months, we now have got a new president in the United States of America, and the same person is tearing apart the treaties that have been signed in saving the world, in saving the globe. And I think it is a challenge. And I think the, the yes, although he is, he, he is President of the United States and uh, he is purportedly doing it you know, with American interest at, at heart, I think the whole world should make the necessary noise with the United Nations that we cannot allow one president of the nature of Donald Trump to derail uh, the whole effort that the, the whole world has put in place to save the world 
and to save us from the calamities. Uh, we've talked about natural disasters, the cyclones, for example. We've talked about food security itself. And, and global warming is, is, is not a myth, like what Donald Trump is trying to say. It is, it is a reality. You just need to go within, within each country. If you look at the temperatures within cities and temperatures in rural areas, they've got variations uh, because of, of building infrastructure within those cities, because of industrialization and the emissions coming from uh, many made actions within cities. A good example is, for example, here, here in the UK, uh, London always will have temperatures above average than the entire of UK because of it is home to over 20 million people, heavily built, uh, a lot of emissions in terms of vehicle, uh, industries, etc. All that has added to the variations in, in, in weather patterns and temperatures, even at a, at a, at a, at a micro level. So it is, it is a reality and uh, you, you don't need even to, to travel further to find evidence that global warming is man demand. So we need, we, need, we need to make sure that the uh, United States is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a leader of a free world, is a superpower, is forced to accept that they cannot uh, have the cake and eat it. Thank you, Elliot. Um, I wanted to zero in a little bit on agriculture. In your book, you, you, you state all of the uh, things that agriculture is involved in, including livestock, uh, cereals, fisheries, biofuel, grain production, and, and a, a few more. Uh, but you also say that the drivers for all of these things is land, water, and optimum temperature. So Indeed. in terms of the land and in terms of the water, uh, which I think in India there's a problem already with water, and also in terms of optimum temperatures, yeah. how, do, how does the agriculture then uh, impact on climate change in specific? Yeah, I think, I think the, the top, for, for example, in terms of uh, chemicals, uh, Yes, of course, we become so much mechanized in our agricultural production. Uh, you find that we are using more and more chemicals. And some of the chemicals that we are using, they've got a profound effect to, uh, to weather patterns as well. And uh, this is why uh, they, there is always research on trying to come up with the best types of, um, of fertilizers or chemicals that we can use that are also uh, friendly to, to, uh, to both to the ecosystem because I think the, we have to talk about the ecosystem uh, in the sense of uh, could be flora, fauna and uh, any organisms that actually depend on, on, on land or on, on an imbalanced type of ecosystem. <laughs> so yes, there is um, there's a correlation in that. In terms of uh, agriculture, we have seen that some countries they still use traditional means of uh, of of of, of, of uh, agro uh, approach, whereby deforestation, uh, because they, they because they are not heavily mechanized. They clear so much land for very little yields of production, and yeah. as such, by destroying forests, uh, some countries we've seen actually desert encroaching. We've actually seen that they've they've also influenced in a way the the, the rainfall pattern. Yeah. So yes, there is. The, 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 there is the, that uh, correlation between the, the agricultural system that we are practicing and also in terms of the effect to rainforest, effect to ecosystem, and 
the, the climate change as well. Right. So how do we make agriculture sustainable? In your book, you state that sustainable agricultural production requires deployment of technology to maximize outputs with minimum damage to the environment. Yes. <coughs> so it's uh, like, for example, uh, I was talking about mechanization. So the best way to, uh, and also I would like to, to link that to the increase in population. Uh, as we, we go towards 2025, where we are going to have 8.5 billion. So we are adding 1.5 billion more people. Yeah. So there, there, there are two ways to ensure food security. One way would be to, to increase the hectares for food production. Okay. Yeah. And the other way is that we can, in which case it means we are clearing more forests. Okay. Which means, are, we, which means we, we are <coughs> encroaching into the ecosystem of the other. Yes. So, so we are unsettling the ecosystem in terms of animals, in terms of other organisms that actually support life. Okay. Which is what we don't want to do. The other way of doing it would be to maximize on the land that we are already producing on using technology, mechanization. Instead of using traditional means of producing, whereby you are using uh, cow drone plows, uh, just to holes, traditional holes, we are then deploying technology, we are deploying uh, combined harvesters, tractors, uh, any technology that actually improves production per hectare. Okay? Yeah. So, in this book, what I was saying is, uh, the, the challenges that we have is that, uh, because uh, land is not a, a, an infinite resource, it's a finite resource. We cannot create land, we can only maximize the use of the land that we already have. Mm -hmm. Yet the population is increasing all the time. I mean, yeah. look at Zimbabwe's population. At Independence, it was 7 million people. Right? At the moment, we are talking about maybe 18, 18, 18 million uh, as we go to 2020. Yeah. Right? Now, look at the the disparity. So it's about uh, since 1980, we've added about 11 million people, right? But we've we, we've not created a new land mass. Okay, it's still the same land that we are talking about, <laughs> right? So all what we need is to to make sure that we maximize the, the use of the same land, and the only way to do it is to mechanize it. Okay. Introduce okay. technology. Okay. Yeah. Can you talk about the disparity between uh, the African continent as one of the, or can I say, the main producer of uh, most of the food which is consumed around the world, and the poverty which is bedeviling the continent in terms of lack of access to clean, to, to safe drinking water, and just simple sanitation. Yeah, I think the challenges that we have is Africa has got uh, so much arable land that it is capable of not only feeding its own people in Africa, but feeding the entire world. And uh, in, in a way, in our small way already, we are feeding the entire world. And why I'm saying so is that you find most of the food that is being exported to the developed world is being produced from developing world. And when we talk about developing world, we are also talking about Africa, uh, India, and the other Asian countries. But Africa comes first, especially in terms of export to European Union. But what you are saying is, how come that uh, the very countries that export to the Western world can't even feed their own citizens. There are two challenges to that. The other challenge is that we, 
I blame the governments in Africa, whereby they don't have coherent policies that actually make sure that she, within those policies, the ring fence their own food security for their own people, uh, subsidizing them sometimes uh, where they cannot afford the food because of production costs. We know that when the moment we talk about mechanization, uh, yes, there is a cost into it, but mass production means the prices will be driven down and at the end of the day it becomes affordable. Yeah. The other problem that we have is that other, the, 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 the estates, farms, in say in Africa, the big estates are actually owned by conglomerates. These conglomerates are actually owned by Western world. So they, the food is actually produced on contract. Before yeah. it's even harvested, it's already it is already been bought, irrespective of the fact that there is famine in that country, and that there is not enough food in that country, and our governments do not have any policies whereby they are in control of such government, such such uh, uh, production or such companies, and I think this is what we need to address as as a continent. And Africa also, we've got a problem within Africa that uh, they, they, there is, there is no coordination in Africa. We are not coordinated. We, we could be a very force to reckon with if Africa itself can even trade within its own member states, which is, which is uh, lacking. For your own information, uh, Africa trade with itself only 30% of its production yeah. and 70% is, is, is actually exported to totally outside Africa. Yet Africa is home to about a billion people. We've got the market. You're right. Um, I think we can tie that up with the Zimbabwe as a case study. Um, if you can comment, I know we've commented on this before, but on the land redistribution exercise. And the main question I want to actually ask on Zimbabwe is, why do we depend on natural rains for agriculture? Yet we don't uh, depend, for example, on solar. We could be dependent, dependent on solar for, for energy, but we are not dependent on solar for some strange reason. But we want to depend on, on if there are good rains, people uh, are jubilant that we've had good rains, so we're going to have a lot of food. I think so, you find our challenges in Zimbabwe is that uh, uh, the dams that we have were, were actually constructed before independence. And uh, as, a, as a government, as a, uh, you know, as a people's government, the ZANPF has misplaced the uh, priorities. We would have expected that by now, instead of uh, uh, just, you know, letting the water run into the ocean, we would have built in dams to harvest that water. But uh, and, one, one of the, the things I've been hearing, and it's, it's funny to hear that, is that even though the dams are, are full, uh, the excuse now is that we don't have the chemicals to process the water. So we still have a water problem, it seems. Yeah, yeah but, but look at it. He, and if you ask them, how much are the chemicals, right? Those, those are trivial uh, figures compared with the 15 billion that the president says is missing from his coffers. Right? All I'm saying is that we have got to misplaced the priorities, misplaced priorities by the government itself through corruption. And for your information, all members of the cabinet, yeah. the, they, they are not millionaires themselves, right? Yeah. And you don't need a multi million, multi million order for that chemicals that we are talking about. Yeah. These are cheap chemicals, chlorine chemicals. 
So, so yes, we've got to, of course, we know there's a the, 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 the financial crisis in Zimbabwe uh, yeah. because, of, because of the type of economy that we are running. But that, that is nothing to do with the inability of Zimbabwe as a country without resources. We have got all the necessary resources. We actually are a Jew of Africa. Yeah. We can actually support the entire Southern Africa, if not the entire corridor from Cape to Cairo. But the so problem is that we don't have the government. How do you think we have handled uh, climate change and sustainable development and food security and agriculture in terms of the land redistribution? How have we managed uh, those four things we're talking about today? After, after acquiring the land? I think it's, it's pathetic, the current situation in Zimbabwe. Yes, of course, I think since, uh, since 1980, we, we accepted that uh, uh, there were 2,500 white farmers who actually owned almost three quarters of, of prime land in Zimbabwe. We accept that. And we accept that that needed to be addressed. We accepted that. But those were 2,500 white farmers controlling th three quarters of arable land. But what do we have at the moment is even a worse scenario. Now those 2,500, you know, prime farms, they were now parceled to less than a thousand connected people within this life. So we've actually made the situation worse. So that three quarters of prime land is now being owned by very few people and worse still these are the people who had no experience no prior training no induction process of how they can utilize the land and this is why at the end of the day for the same land Zimbabwe cannot feed itself yet for the same land before 1980, the same land was able to produce enough for the entire country, export to Africa, export to the entire world. Yeah. So what we have is a very shambolic, it's not a land redistribution at all. Because you do, if you are going to do a land redistribution, you, you properly distribute it, empowering the very people that you are giving the land. And in this case, that was not the case. So we have got, so the, the problem of the land still is an unfinished business. It was an unfinished business during the white colonial rule. It is still an unfinished business because you cannot have a situation whereby three quarters of the entire landmass in a country is owned by a political party. Yes, there's a question for you, Elliot. Yes. Uh, Elliot, where do you get those figures? It's from one of my viewers on Facebook. Thank you for the question, Douglas. Yes, my, my figures. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. Well, this is this is my area of expertise. So I I read quite a lot, of course. I researched quite a lot in terms of uh, uh, sustainable development, climate change, in terms of, of course. Zimbabwe being as a politician I, I I don't believe that you only talk politics of sloganeering without putting specific figures on how you want to address the situation. You need to understand the quantitative, the empirical evidence of what is what is it exactly you are trying to change so yes so those figures are based on, on my knowledge of the area and research. Uh, it's, uh, it, I, it, it's, um, it's not disputing as such, but uh, he's surprised that a thousand people will take over what? Uh, 2000, was it 2500? 2500, yeah. Yeah. So he said that will be, if true, that's Western colonization. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, this is why we are saying that is even a worse scenario. We now have got a few people, you know, controlling three quarters of prime land 
Right, let's move on to fair trade. According to Caroline S. 1996, uh, ethical consumerism refers to buyer behavior that reflects a concern with the problems of the third world, where producers are paid low wages and live in poor conditions simply to produce uh, to produce cheap products for Western consumers and businesses. I forgot to bring up what I, uh, I was reading my <coughs> box of uh, tea leaves in the kitchen, and there's a message. Uh, one of the messages on, on the box is, is the fact that that company um, is practicing ethical consumerism, or in other words, it's practicing fair trade mm. and it's looking after it has made sure that the children of the growers when the, the growers themselves are paid uh, fair wages and their children have uh, they've built schools for the children in, the, in that area so they are making sure that the children can can also go to school now what is your comment on that i, I, th I think i look at it the, yes, we've got a new breed of consumers uh, who are very knowledgeable of what is going on in the world, and especially yeah, after yeah. after having. Yeah, okay. Thank you, sir. I like you that you agreed with the learning question. That's the latest comment from our viewers. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, sorry. What, what what was the comment? That he is happy you agreed with the learning question. Okay, good. Yeah. So, so yes, what 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 I was saying here is that the the new breed of consumers they know what they want, and I think after having you know experienced these uh, cases whereby the big companies are also uh, using child labor, abusing child labor and paying sometimes virtually uh, uh, peanuts for producing uh, branded goods which all these branded goods ended up in the western world and uh, enriching the west at the expense of the developing world and i think uh, yes the new co the, the, uh, today's consumers uh, we are very sensitive as to where exactly these products that we are consuming are coming from and whether the those companies have paid their fair share of it. But yes, we've got this brand, the brand, the, the fair trade brand. Uh, yes, it's a welcome gesture and I think I also alluded to it in my book. Yeah. But it's not, it's not enough to put a logo on a product. And I think we, we, we also need to take audit of whether does it really reflect what is happening on the ground by those yeah. organizations? Yeah. I think this is this is where the problem is. It's it's it's, it's like a, you know corporate social responsibility, where everybody, every company, will tell you that they are corporate social responsibility compliant. Yeah, but then if you go on the ground that. to do a proper audit, you find that there is nothing on the ground to show yeah. that uh, they are behaving ethically it's like it's like a teenager sex where everybody is talking about it but nobody is doing it yeah i remember um one incident where the new minister of industry at the time uh, things might be uh, almost got stuck in a in a, in a big uh, portal uh, while traveling to marange and he was surprised that with all that uh, money which has been coming out of all the diamonds from around him, mm. the roads have not been serviced. Oh, yes. Yeah. But you can see the type, you know, the, 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 the mental state of our politicians, you know, that uh, misplaced priorities, I've always been saying. That those things, they, to you and me, it's common sense, isn't it? Right. If you if you have got resources, you've got diamond mines, then the diamond mines, you know, the proceeds must also benefit the community in a way. And road network should be a priority. Because they use the same roads, right? To transport their goods, to trans 
support the diamonds, right? And these yeah. very the, the directors they drive in and out. They know that the roads are impossible. They actually try to negotiate, you know, potholes. Whilst they are stashing millions and millions of pounds. Oh, yes, I think one, one businessman actually posted that now he has got a car which can which, which, which can go around potholes like this because it's <laughs> such a, <laughs> a big car. Yeah. <laughs> but then, then you say, why don't he just you, you know just repair the pothole yeah. with the very man in your boat? And mind you, the money in the bottle will be will more than the cost of the of the bottle. Yes, Douglas says we lack a growth mindset. Mm. Uh, well said. So thank you, Douglas. Um, yes. So I think we're coming to the end of, of today's uh, talk. Uh, we've been talking about. Um, we've been looking at chapter four of Elliot's book on social justice and food security and chapter four is agriculture and food security a responsibility for climate change and sustainable development okay so i think we need sustainable development in many areas including mining as we've just said so it's not just in agriculture and food security but it's in mining and it's everything else within the country we should treat the country as an ecosystem of uh, things that need to be done uh, by not just looking at one thing, but by looking at, at, at everything. Yeah. Uh, and also... From a holistic approach. Holistic yeah. approach. And also to look at the, the global impact of what we're doing locally. Oh, yeah. and, the, and the local impact of, of, of global decisions which, can, which may be made by people like Donald Trump, for example. Yeah. So... We need to think globally and act locally. Act locally and think globally. Thank yeah. you. Uh, and thank you to, to Douglas for your comments, which we have tried to include uh, in our discussion with Elliot today. Elliot, any um, closing statement? No, I just want to thank our viewers, and uh, I also want to uh, apologize that we, we didn't uh, air a session last Sunday, uh, we we thought of uh, giving it a special Mother's Day to yes. all our mothers and children. And so and yes, Mother's Day yeah. to all our mothers. So yes, uh, right. so we'll continue every Sunday as, as usual and uh, we value your presence and please keep uh, sending your your, your questions uh, could be comments or further information that you want us to articulate or to discuss please feel free and uh, this program is your program thank you thank you very much